Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. And here is today's presenter, Matthew Bloomfield. The message today is called Stop Giving Satan Access to Your Life. Now, as Christians, uh, when we go through trials in life, we should come out the other end closer to God. Um, that's the way it's supposed to work, uh, according to the Bible. As, as Christians, that makes sense. However, if you're finding that the difficulties of your life are drawing you further away from God, uh, if you don't see any hope of getting through them, uh, then chances are you may have a spiritual breach in your life, uh, something that is giving Satan access uh, to your life. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in this message today. Uh, in, in ancient times, the strength of a city was determined by the strength of its walls. The classic example, of course, is the Great Wall of China, uh, which at its thickest point is 16 metres through. Now, that's a pretty substantive wall. And, you know, our, our minds go, go back to cities like Babylon uh, and the huge wall that surrounded that, some 60, 60 feet across. Uh, they said they had chariot races on the top of it. Um, when an army approached walls such as these, it was almost impossible uh, for them to gain access, uh, to, to break through. So instead, uh, when an army approached a wall like this, they couldn't just use brute force. They'd have to use subtler, subtler, more subtle tactics. Um, they'd have to send out Scouts and look for, for small breaches in the wall, cracks and um, perhaps a, a gate that wasn't so well guarded or uh, something like that. They'd have to find weak spots in the wall. And you know, uh, Satan works in much the same way. Uh, he's not necessarily going to try and attack a strong wall. Um, perhaps your belief in the Bible is 100% sure. Nothing could shake you uh, from believing uh, the Word of God. Satan's not going to try and attack that for you, perhaps. Uh, he, he's going to find something else. He's going to look for a weak spot, spot a small crack uh, where he can snake through. He doesn't care what the breach is. Um, perhaps it could be pride or lust or addictions. If he can find a breach, he can use it to gain a foothold in your life. Uh, when we hold on to sin and ungodly behaviors, it's like we break down our spiritual fortification. Uh, Solomon puts it like this. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. That's a good, it's an apt picture, isn't it? Now, more than ever, uh, we need all the protection we can get. You know, we talk about putting on the armor of God, um, which we need to do, uh, but we also don't want to um, leave any cracks in that armor. Uh, there's a really good passage in Ephesians uh, that spells a few things out. Uh, Paul tells us that there are even seemingly small things uh, that can give Satan access to our lives. And uh, if you've got your Bibles, uh, I might pay to turn to it because uh, we're going to, to keep referring back to this passage. I'll have it up on, on the board as well. Uh, but it reads, this is just part of it. It says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. If you have a different translation, it might say something uh, Slightly different for give place to the devil. Uh, some translations say, 
do not give the devil an opportunity. Other translations say, do not give the devil a foothold. What's a foothold? Yeah, yeah it's a first step in. <laughs> Let's read that passage, actually. Um, sorry, I know you've already got it all there, but uh, it would probably do us well to, to read through it before we go. Ephesians 4. Uh, starting in verse 23, 22. It says, That he put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I think that's a really good and a really challenging passage for us. Let's have a look at some of these footholds that he mentions. Uh, footholds that might be giving, we might be giving Satan. In order to find them, we need to ask God for help. Because some of these things... Uh, we may have been holding on to for years. Uh, they may have, we may uh, have become completely blind to them, or mostly blind anyway. So let's search for these spiritual breaches. And, and just as a side note, we're, we're looking a lot at sin and Satan's tactics in this message, and I, I don't want us to lose focus. Um, Satan is not omnipresent. Uh, we know from the Bible that he is a defeated foe, that he can be resisted, but only if we attach ourselves to Jesus. So uh, even though we're focusing, uh, going to be focusing a lot on, on his footholds, the ways he can work his way into our lives, I, I don't want us to lose focus and, and think that it's hopeless, because it's not, and we'll cover that a bit more. Um, here is what David prayed, and this needs to be our prayer as well as we start to look at these things. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. <laughs> so we're, we're asking God to, to turn that holy light onto our lives and see if there's any wicked way in us uh, because we want to be in that way everlasting, don't we? We need to know exactly where these holes in our spiritual fortification are. Um, what we're going to go through today isn't a complete list, obviously, but just some common things and a couple of things that we don't normally talk about so much. The first one is cherished sins. We know that sin is the breaking of God's law. Um, we've looked at that verse uh, many times in our afternoon study, First uh, John 3, 4, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Uh, that's a biblical definition. So th this is sort of um, basement floor footholds. Cherished sins are those things that we've become a little bit comfortable with. 
those that when we commit them, we hold off on repenting because we think, oh, it's not a big deal, um, or I'll sort that out later, or perhaps not again. <laughs> it's awkward and embarrassing to, to go to God with this exact same thing yet again. Notice what's written in Isaiah. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Is God able to help us according to that passage? The Lord's hand isn't shortened. It, um, he's more than, than willing to help. He's more than willing to listen. However, it says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. Now, is this talking about sins that we've sought pardon for and confessed to God? No. It's talking about iniquity. It's deliberate sin. This passage tells us that God wants to help us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to give us the victory. But he can only do that when we give our sins to him, when we lay them down at the foot of the cross and confess them to him. Otherwise, God's hands are, are somewhat tied. If we have sins that we have not confessed to God, that is a major breach in our spiritual fortification. You might be thinking, how do I know? How do I know if I have sins that I haven't confessed to God or, or that I'm cherishing? In my experience as a Christian, I know the things that, that I'm cherishing and that I'm holding on to. But, you know, um, this is a question I, I get a, a lot online. Is how can I confess everything if I, I don't, don't know it? Well, Oh, I skipped a verse there. In John 16, verse 8, speaking about the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, And when He, the Holy Spirit, has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to point out sins uh, in our lives, uh, to point out uh, what we need to confess. Um, so, we need to ask Him, Lord, Show me, is there something in my life that, that I need to, to confess? Ephesians 4.30, in that same passage, Paul pleads with us, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When the Holy Spirit points something out in our lives, uh, we need to do something about it. Uh, we're told to not grieve, we're, we're not to... Ignore what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Let's look at some less obvious uh, but more insidious breaches. Putting God second. Most people don't bow down and worship graven images. Let me rephrase that. Most people here, I hope, don't bow down and worship graven images. But really, an idol is anything that we're putting above God, that we're trying to put in the place of God. Perhaps you spend five or ten minutes in the morning uh, and you're reading the Bible or, or praying, and then you go and spend the next half hour uh, scrolling through every single news story uh, that pops up online or scrolling through your social media uh, until you know, everything's exhausted and you've seen everything. In situations like that, we, ha we have to ask, you know, where are our priorities? What are we putting first in our lives? Uh, maybe you'd rather have the, the TV playing to, to drown out that voice of the Holy Spirit. Just have it going in the background so that there's a noise. 
uh, so that, that you don't have to listen to, to that, that, that no, I don't want to use the word nagging, but uh, <laughs> persistent uh, voice of the Holy Spirit. Where does your heart really lie? Jesus gives us an invitation. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. These things that Jesus is referring to are, are all the things we need in life. He's promising that if we put him first, he will take care of everything else. If we put him as our first priority, he will ensure that we're provided for. However, unfortunately, it's all too easy at times to get this the wrong way around. And you know what? Satan really likes it uh, when we get this one the wrong way around. Because we know that when Satan was still an angel in heaven, a similar desire blossomed in his heart. Uh, we read about him. It says there in Isaiah, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan wanted to take God's place. We know that. We went through that in our afternoon studies. So if we take God off you know, figuratively speaking, take God off the throne in our lives and we put something else or we put ourselves or our desires or Facebook or the news in its place, then Satan's more than happy. You know, if, he's, if he can't directly get himself on that throne, so long as we're, we're not putting God in the first place, he's, he's reasonably content with that and that gives him a foothold into our lives. Sinful speech. One sin that we often overlook because it's so very, very common is sinful speech. You know, if we watch TV or we watch videos online, then we're constantly bombarded with it. And I, I, I find this, you know, I, I end up watching a, a lot online. People send me things and things pop up and this, this is something I struggle with. Um, watching videos online. It, it's just full of this. Uh, and these sins are, are even prevalent in the lives of many Christians today. Uh, notice how seriously uh, this is taken in the Bible. In James it says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. If you don't get control of your tongue, he says, your religion is useless. That's not my words. It's what the Bible says. Yeah. So why would James write something so harsh? Jesus said in Luke 6, he says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. When there is sinful speech coming out of our mouths, it shows that there is something wrong in our hearts. When we gossip, it shows that we don't have a true regard for the people for whom Christ has died. It shows that we don't see them in the same way that Jesus sees them. When we complain, it shows a lack of trust in God's ability to work in our lives. If we're constantly complaining about things. When we use coarse language, it shows that we still have our mind back in the world. That we're filling our hearts with things that we shouldn't be filling it with. In fact, going back to Ephesians 4, one of the things that 
is written there. It says, no corrupt word proceed out of your, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Number four, ungodly behaviors. Ephesians 4 lists two really important breaches uh, in our spiritual fortification uh, as far as behavior goes. The first one is anger. Uh, there's a couple of verses about that. The one we already read, which says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Is it wrath or wrath? Wrath. Thank you. That's what I've always said. That's good. That's good to know. Good to have it confirmed. <laughs> do, not let, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. There is a place for anger, we read in the Bible. Um, but not many of us, in fact, I would say, Hardly any of us are in a place that, that we can uh, make use of it or safely implement it. Jesus could. Uh, we see that in a couple of, couple of instances. Uh, but he was not angered with personal attacks against himself. He, he took those. Um, but instead, he, he was angered by hypocrisy and injustice done to, to sincere people. Justifiable anger... Is, the wrong, is, is against the wrong act without holding on to hate against the person who has done it. And, you know, I, I think most of us, well, I am, me, speaking for myself, I'm not a, in a, a safe enough position to make that distinction, so it's best to avoid it altogether. Um, perhaps this is why in this verse, uh, he especially warns us to not let the sun go down on our anger, because uh, we're not, we're not, it's not safe, not safe for us to do that. He goes on to say in verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Have you done that? Or can Satan still claim these things as footholds in your life? It's like um, disturbance, upset. Yeah, noise. Yeah. The second ungodly behavior listed in this passage is this one, verse 28. It says, Let him who stole steal no longer but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. How honest are we in our work? Um, are we lazy on the job? Uh, do we waste time, money, or resources? These are, these are all questions that we can ask ourselves. Number five. Satanic strongholds. I didn't come up with that phrase. I saw it somewhere. As Bible-believing Christians, uh, there are certain things that we should have absolutely nothing to do with. Um, there are obvious ones like addictive substances, uh, pornography, spiritualist practices, fortune tellers, tarot cards, Counseling, uh, consulting with mediums and horoscopes, that sort of thing. Those, those are, are obvious things. Uh, the Bible is clear uh, in its condemnation of these practices. It says, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Uh, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In Deuteronomy, it says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or anyone who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. You know, Satan, for you know, most Christians, Satan struggles to bring blatant things like these into our lives. Um, I don't think any of us here are actively involved in witchcraft or 
or fortune telling or you know consulting mediums but like we said in the beginning sometimes Satan takes a subtler a more subtle pro approach uh, to this rather than getting us to sit down in front of a crystal ball in, in some back alley he will give us books to read he'll give us movies to watch that make all these things seem fun light-hearted perhaps and enjoyable uh, maybe it's magic uh, maybe it's talking to dead people maybe it's murder mysteries maybe it's something that's glorifying crime and sin or mindfulness <laughs> um, Satan has something for everyone you might be thinking and I know some people think this hold on a minute I know the difference between watching a video glorifying sin and the actual sin itself I can tell the difference it's not the same thing let me give you an illustration look at it this way imagine I'm sitting down at home looking through a photo album uh, photos of me and an ex-girlfriend all the fun times we had I'm just sitting there enjoying reminiscing on those days and Catherine walks in she's upset uh, and she wants to know what on earth I'm doing I explain settle down never a good way to start a sentence but <laughs> settle down I'm just remembering all the fun times I used to have <laughs> this is just an illustration it's not something that happened but don't worry I know all those fun times are in the past I'm with you now how well do you think that's going to go <laughs> not very well and you know it's like that how when we find entertainment and the sins that put Jesus on the cross when we find entertainment and sin it's like we're looking back at photos of our old life of sin and saying you know, that's where I really want to be the good old days um, and th this should go without saying I'm not sharing these things because I'm perfect and, and have everything laid out I'm sharing these things because they're in the Bible and God is calling us all to a higher standard number six sins of omission in that passage of Ephesians 4 we see that it's not just putting away wrong things but doing what is right Paul encourages us in verse 32 he says and be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God and Christ forgave you and this idea is really made clear again in James he says therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him it is sin uh, just as it is sin according to the Bible to transgress God's law God also calls out calls us to live out our faith uh, to to do Christianity now uh, I, I don't know how you'd put a, a list together of that but God impresses us to do things sometimes oftentimes whether it's to say a word uh, to someone whether it's to help someone uh, to give someone a, a, a phone call whether it's to uh, pop in on on someone's house you know as you're heading home uh, we're to do the things that we know that we know are right you know it, it might be completely surrendering our lives to God that's something we know we need to do it might be having a true hatred of sin and the most important thing that we often miss is seeking God uh, with all our heart in Jeremiah 
we are encouraged, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Why is that the most important task? Because it is God who works in us to take care of all these spiritual breaches. You know, we might be looking at, at this list and thinking, gosh, that's a lot. <laughs> um, but if we take care of this one thing, seeking God with all of our hearts, uh, He will take care of all these other things. If we put our lives in His hand, it is God who comes into our, our life and patches up all these cracks. Uh, and just look at the list of gifts He gives us uh, when we seek Him. Uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Seeking God is our most important work. And this is the very first step in protecting us against Satan. I haven't got this uh, on the board, but let's just look up another verse before we finish off. Let's go to John 14. And, you know, the, the last, last few messages I've shared have been about you know, spending time with God and putting Him first. But uh, we're looking at all these topics in the light of uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I believe Jesus is coming soon, and God is looking for a people that He can use in a way, uh, in a way that He's never used people before. Uh, that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out in a way that that we can't even comprehend now. Uh, let's have a look at John. 14 and verse 15. You know, we know this, this verse back to front, if you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus says. But look at the next verse. And, it means it follows on from what he just said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. Why does, why does God need us following him before he can pour out the Holy Spirit? It's because the Holy Spirit <laughs> enables us to do God's work with such a mighty power that we can't, can't be trusted <laughs> uh, with it uh, unless we're fully consecrated to God unless we've fully given our, our lives over to Him. Now, God doesn't want people out, out there um, healing and doing all sorts of wonderful true works um, if on the flip side of the coin uh, they're, they're breaking His law and they're doing all sorts of horrible things. It's not the way it works. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it says, if it would be as if God were sanctioning evil. And so God wants to bless us. He wants to help us. Uh, we just need to put ourselves uh, in his company. Yeah, otherwise we tie his hands. His, his hands are not shortened, but by our actions. Uh, so my prayer for this week is that we ask God to point out these things in our lives. Uh, hopefully some of the things we've read will trigger trigger um, trigger us to, uh, to to know what's wrong in our lives uh, work out what's holding us back uh, what's giving Satan a foothold in our lives and by the power that God gives us that we might overcome these things so that's my my prayer uh, for this week. This message was made available by the Masterton Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
For more resources like this, visit mastertonsda.nz. This program has been brought to you by 3ABN Australia Radio.